nature about, you know, this is what we do. This is what we offer. I think that these may be your needs. Can you validate that? And, and does this make sense? Okay, great. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Let me help you find something that works for you. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like that's the, the environment we're in, you know, where somebody can't come and say very easily create a lifestyle brand for us. Well, are you a lifestyle brand? If you have that at your core right. and you have a good story and you're genuine, so I, think I can do something with that, right. but I can't put a veneer over something that is not. Right. Yeah. Good, good point. You know, I've seen that more here in Montana than I've seen anywhere in my life in marketing because the brands that are built here are out of necessity and out of uh, not only necessity to have something that works, whether that's a piece of equipment a knife, a apparel brand, um, but also the necessity to survive financially. Somebody, you know, creates something and then they sell it. You've got commerce and then you have real support from the community to say, hey, this is a Montana brand and I know the owner and I know why he's doing it. You know, he used this hunting knife, you know, because it's a necessary tool, but he made it quality so it lasts forever and now he sells it. And um, it's really interesting to see that and it's refreshing to see that. And like you said, you, you know, are you really a lifestyle brand? Maybe. Or do, does some corporate office own you and they don't even know the first thing about getting dirty? Right. And people will find out. Yeah. Right. I tell my teenage boys, like, look, let's all be honest with each other here because the truth always comes out. And I think that's the case with these brands too, mm -hmm. especially with what happens, you know, in Montana with people coming in and there's hedge fund money moving all around and things are trying to be authentic and sort of later, but it, when it's built from sort of the ground up in a way that is genuine, I think that's truly what resonates. And storytelling is a big thing. We have a position open now for mm -hmm. storytellers and that's actually what we call them. Yeah. Social media people that we hire, journalists are the best ones. They understand the who, what, when, where, why. You know, they can really get into the heart of a story because that's what our brains like. They like a beginning, a middle and an end. Yeah. And I think that's what resonates with people. So when you're talking about Montana brands that are true to the area that garner local support, because there's a real story there, that's true. And that's authentic. And I think that's really important. Yeah. What I love about Montana is a sidebar. It gets so cold here. We flush out the week. So you get these hedge, hedge fund dollars come in. They think they're going to be Montana and uh, they just don't survive. I was feeding the cattle the other day and the, the snow was blowing sideways. And I took a video. I said, hey, all you Yellowstone fans, this is what it's really like here. <laughs> I was like, well, oh we my say God. the same thing about Florida in the summer. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's so great that you've brought your clay colored cayenne here <laughs> and it's got really nice air conditioning. And I hope you enjoy that. But talk to me in July yeah. if you're still here. A lot of of them leave right yep. but if we're still here in july let's talk about like how lovely the tropics are because it's rough yeah absolutely hey rough. let's talk about wild coffee marketing and what i love about some of the videos that i saw in your instagram stories was your discussion about being the cmo for these companies you know that they can't scale can't have the team but you're providing that and i i do feel like we live uh, and operate in a, in a time where this is more needed now than ever. Um, talk about that business model and why it's important and some of the value you've given there. Well, you know, every company needs a CMO, but you just may not be able to afford one right. or it may not be necessary to have them on board full time. But if you just start marketing and start implementing and executing plans and strategy, there's no strategy behind that. And we believe that it is really important to stop, pause, sort of do that foundational work. Who is your target? What are their pain points? What do they believe? Where are they? How can you communicate with them in a way, again, that's genuine and authentic? Mm -hmm. um, what, is it a growth strategy? Does it involve your digital transformation? You know, sort of what is the crux of that? And then we can hand that to a CEO and say, okay, here's the strategy you sign off on. Would you like to implement it in-house? Do you already have a team there? great. And if you don't, we can form fractional teams, right? Because people are expected as marketers, we are expected to go so wide and so deep with our skill sets. It's really hard to run an in-house team in this environment. Yeah. So to assemble a fractional team and then not have to take on the risk of the overhead and maybe within six months, do you remember when we used to do annual plans? Yeah. Doesn't that sound funny? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we plan three or five years for the business, but from a marketing perspective, you can't you don't know what 12 months is going to look like. Right. So it may be a team that you have in the first quarter is not the same needs of the business in fourth quarter. And that's why this sort of outsourced model 
you know, anchored by strategy ends up being more, makes more sense when you can mix a set of team members and skills in a fractional way. Well, and, and I think of all the things that you can utilize contract work for, I don't mean to minimize what you're doing as contract work, but of all the things, to me, this makes the most sense. Because when you really look at the sales department, the operations department, there's just certain departments you have to have feet on the ground where the value of having an external CMO and team of people, like you said, you know, the fractional cost of that first and foremost, because almost everything's its own silo if you hired it within house, you know, a social media expert, a print ex, you know, boom, boom, boom. But to utilize somebody outside that's got their finger on the pulse across the board, you just almost can't do that in house and make it affordable to have that great team that you're offering. Right. Right. Cause you don't, you know, you may need some SEO mm -hmm. at one point, but then you may need, you know, five content writers, but only two, or we've seen situations where big brands are sort of shackled by an in-house design team who've maybe sort of lost their luster or motivation where they've sort of maxed out. Or what about designers for different mediums? Right. So you need video designers. Maybe somebody's better at web. Maybe someone's super good at conceptual and print. You know, we, we can sit and assemble those teams and be really, really nimble and flexible in a way that reduces the cross structure and the risk for our clients. Yeah. So, and we're all client side marketers, right? Most of us have been CMOs or VPs of marketing. And then you have to blend that with a client management skill set. And it's not for everyone, it is a, it's really hard work to be an outsourced team and to work on four or five accounts at the same time. Um, but we have a really smart team that's really good at it. Yeah. Well, I think just like you might plan out your marketing in the olden days for a year, you just take those skills and transfer it to all the companies that you're supporting, right? Yes. And what's great about that, I think often overlooked, is the value that you bring to the table by working with other companies yes. to know what works and what doesn't work. You know, maybe somebody wants to take a high risk uh, marketing spend somewhere and it turns out to be a mistake. Well, they paid the dummy tax so the other four companies don't have to, right? You say, look, trust me, that doesn't work, right? Yes, absolutely. And taking the learnings, right? You know, we work in the marine industry mm -hmm. and there's dealer networks and then there's direct to consumer. But then we take that into retail where we have a hundred locations for men's formal wear. And we are actually applying dealer network principles from marine into retail. Mm. So I think that, you know, marketing is a discipline. And, you know, I was in a pitch meeting recently and it was for financial services. And I said, yes, I have 20 years of financial service marketing experience. But to be honest, give me anything and I will market it. Right. I mean, I don't care what it yeah. is. I mean, it is a discipline and you apply it to different markets and products and targets. And um, that's why we're able to sort of ramp up really quickly. And imagine you hire an in-house team, the time that takes, the oh. overhead costs you have, yep. the risk with getting locked in with them. Yep. Right. Yeah. I mean, I may have commitment issues at personally, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I also understand with business, with CEOs, like you hire a CMO, that is a huge investment. Yeah. And then how long do you, does it take you to know whether or not it's working? You know, I think in this environment, you know, people want to be able to make change really quickly. I can make change. If there's a team that's not right for an account. We can change. That's not happened, but we have that ability to do that. And I just think it's, it's a more nimble way of working and more pragmatic way of working. Well, what I love about this way of working is that it does allow opportunity for startups, our early entry to market companies to afford the team that they need to take them to the next level. And hopefully they understand how important that marketing team can be for their success, especially early on. Building out those strategies and those quarterly plans and being nimble with the market and certainly having some experience across the board to bring them that. You could not afford to bring that type of team in a startup. Um, if you had to hire it all in house. Right. And, but you know, what we find is that co-founders believe they know everything oh, yeah. about marketing. Yeah. So that's the one challenge in those early stage startups, really skilled, smart co-founders who think that they have the magic bullet. We like to get our hands on them after they've failed. <laughs> <laughs> <You're mean. laughs> after they have failed a little bit. They've raised a series A and they're like, okay, I'm ready. I, I may be uncle. I, I don't know everything. And maybe, you know, Amy and Solomon's 25 to 30 years of the dummy tax with them. And this nimble team makes sense. Yeah. I love it. 
Well, look, our time flew by. I've got to wrap it up. I uh, really appreciate your insights and uh, having some fun talking about New York City. Wild Coffee Marketing. I'll put your website up on the show notes. Any last closing thoughts from you? Great. No, um, thanks so much for having me today. And, and I do think it's a it's just an interesting time to be having these conversations, um, a time of like great sort of change again. We had it in the 90s. And now I think we're really sort of experiencing it here. And, and it's just really fun for me be, to be able to talk to you about it. So thanks, Jim. I love it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Please tune in to the next show. And that was Wild Coffee Marketing.